Hey folks, we're back with another episode of Skirmish Supremacy, and uh, as usual, I am your host Tim, joined by my co-host Nick. Nick, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Okay, I don't that's have enough talking. Oh. <laughs> but uh, today we actually have a very special guest. It's uh, Patrick Keith. I'm going to call him Sculptor Extraordinaire. Patrick, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Cool, cool. So one of the things you mentioned before is you're actually a big fan of the show. Uh, yeah, actually I am. And uh, it's it really kind of weird how that sort of started. Um, I've been lurking over on the 15 millimeter sci-fi group on Facebook for, you know, a couple of years now. And uh, one of the guys over there, uh, Harold Crossley, that runs uh, Clear Horizon Miniatures and, and produces 15 millimeter models for sci-fi gaming, he started up his own podcast, basically um, specifically for the 15 millimeter um, crowd, you know. And so it's called In the Garage, and, and every, you know, each episode they uh, talk about 15 millimeter stuff. And I started listening to that, you know, from there, and then. I kind of ran out of episodes of that, and I was like, "Well, I, you know, I, I enjoy listening to, um, you know, it, it's kind of like paint club in a way, because I can put the headphones on while I'm sculpting at the workbench and listen to that, you know, and it's kind of like having other people in the studio with me just talking about stuff, you know, particularly industry things and, and hobby-related stuff. So I started searching around for, like, other miniatures and gaming related podcasts and Skirmish Supremacy was the first one that I came to and so I thought oh okay well this is this sounds cool and I listened to a couple of episodes and I realized that its focus was uh, indie game publishers and, and indie miniatures producers and that sort of thing and I was like well shit that's what I do <laughs> you know so uh, so I listened to you know all of the, uh, the the podcasts that you guys had and I think it was like um I think by by the time that uh, I had gotten in on it, it was about ten episodes or so, or something like that. So um, so yeah, I've, I've been listening to uh, to it for you know a couple of months now. I listened to all the back catalog and then got caught up. Nice, nice. Yeah, I don't even know what episode this is, Nick. Is this nineteen? I think this is nineteen. It's nineteen okay. twenty. Well, damn, you missed it by just just one <laughs> by one. <laughs> Cool. So anyway, just to give everybody a heads up, Patrick Keith has been sculpting for a very, very long time. He's actually sculpted for numerous miniatures lines. Um, so he's actually got his own company called Bombshell Miniatures. You've probably seen it out on Kickstarter, and I'm sure we'll go into that quite a bit tonight. But Patrick, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got started, what companies you've worked for, things of that nature. Okay. Uh, well, I, I started sculpting... Uh, professionally around 2006. Um, I had, uh, <laughs> which is, it's, it's really kind of a, a long sort of backstory, but I'll, I'll chop it down for you. It's, uh, I knew uh, Ron Hawkins, the art director uh, at Reaper Miniatures, as one of my customers when I was a manager at uh, one of our local game stores uh, back in the 90s. And so I had taken a trip to Gen Con and actually, I had, had visited Reaper Miniatures and stuff, um, you know, prior to that. And so I ran into Ron just just out of the clear blue at, at Gen Con, and he had asked me, he was like, well, hey, um, have you been doing any sculpting or, you know, any miniatures things or whatever? And at the time that I was there at Gen Con, I was doing 2D artwork and had just had some art published in the very first edition of Fantasy Flight Games Game of Thrones card game. And so I was there kind of selling prints and all this kind of stuff, and I was like, I hadn't really thought about, you know, doing sculpting stuff, you know, for, for quite a while, you know. So he's like, well, hey, if you ever do, um, you know, why don't you come out and see me and, you know, bring some stuff out. So that kind of stuck in my in my mind, and um, I I went back home and I thought, you know, maybe I should, I should try, you know, sculpting some stuff. So I, I did a few little figures and took them out to Reaper and showed them to them, and they were really, you know, kind of crude because I wasn't really uh, adept at using green stuff, you know, so because it's a it's a very difficult sculpting material. Um, and so I, I, over the course of about six months or so, um, I, you know, kept working on stuff. I went to uh, the Reaper Artist Conference that they had in October at that time and took some classes from some of the other professional sculptors I took a sculpting faces class with Sandy Garrity and uh, some armor classes with Bobby Jackson and just a bunch of uh, bunch of great folks, you know, that were really 
really awesome, you know, uh, to have classes with. And uh, so after that, I, I honed my skills and finally sold my first piece to Reaper, uh, you know, in 2006. So then I was kind of a semi-professional sculptor. You know, I sell a few pieces here and there. I, I sold some stuff to Impact Miniatures for, like, their Blood Bowl stuff and, uh, and just continued to do that uh, off and on, you know, as I could, you know, uh, do, you know, pieces for different clients. Cool. So you were, how many companies have you sculpted for now? It's about over 30 different miniatures companies. There, a lot of them are like little small companies, but most of them, most of the ones that you would recognize are going to be, you know, CMON. I did a couple of pieces for Dark Age, and I did, uh, done a lot of El Larry Elmore stuff for Dark Sword miniatures. I've sculpted tons of Pathfinder stuff for Reaper miniatures. Um, and, and all of that stuff subsequently was turned into to bones, you know, so they've, they've got a lot of my pieces in that material now. And um, uh, Privateer Press, I've done uh, the uh, Kalissa, I guess, for, oh, what's the faction that she's in? I can't remember that. Uh, it's too much stuff to keep up with at this point. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, just um, pretty much everybody that you can think of. Uh, over on the other side, across the pond, I've done stuff for other world miniatures. I did a line of uh, some of their female adventurers um, over there, and uh, yeah, just just lots of stuff. Wow, so you've been all over. See, I, I knew obviously with my background, I knew Simon. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I was aware that you did some stuff for uh, Dark Sword, but uh, yeah, as far as Privateer, that, that was news to me. Yeah, yeah, I've done uh, five or six pieces. for. Well, I did a set of the Mage Hunter Infiltrators uh, for, uh, I, I think that's the, the biggest set of stuff that I did. That was, there's Those are all my sculpts. And I did uh, Farlor and the um, uh, the Standard Bearer for the Legion of Everblight. And uh, uh, the Beast Mistress also. So... Oh, and, and probably the big one that I'm, I'm most known for for the Privateer Press stuff is the Druid Gone Wilder uh, special edition piece that they sell, you know, during uh, convention time. So, yeah. yeah. So I did that one. Nice. So, so, go ahead, Nick. Sorry about that. <laughs> it was actually kind of funny. So I've seen your company, Bombshell Minis. I've see, I saw their stuff a while back because I, I like the retro sci-fi stuff. Mm -hmm. But... One night you were hosting a hangout over in the Facebook Hangouts group, and I just I joined and and people were talking back and forth and somebody was like, oh hey look at this look at this model that I'm working on and it was it was one of the one of the Privateer Press ones and you, you were you know sitting there working on something and you went oh yeah I I did that one <laughs> yeah 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 that's that's kind of funny um, I I wind up. Um, trolling the internet, basically. I mean, what happens is, is like, you know, people will post stuff, and it comes up in my feed on Facebook, and it, it's like, oh, there's a thing I sculpted, and oh, look, there's another thing I sculpted, you know. So I'll just kind of, you know, snipe in and, and post, hey, that looks cool, or, you know, that's a nice paint job, or or whatever, but it's there's so much of it floating around out there now, it's, it's starting to filter back to me, and it's really kind of cool to see stuff, you know, painted by you know, all of these different people that, uh, you know, and some stuff I've even forgotten about. Like some of the Reaper pieces I'll see, you know, like on their, you know, Facebook group or something, and it's like, ah, I, I think I sculpted that, you know, and I'll have to go look it up, you know, so. <laughs> That's got to be a hard thing. It's like, did I sculpt that? Didn't I? Am I <laughs> taking credit for something I didn't do? Yeah, yeah, and I, I definitely don't want to do that. Uh there's a, there, you know, there's a couple of mix-ups there, uh, there for a while because I got reassigned some pieces from a couple of the other sculptors. The blister packs went out with their names on them, but I had actually sculpted them, and then they went back and changed the names, you know, on it later, you know, after they realized it's like, oh, wait, wait, we changed that. Actually, Patrick sculpted that one, you know, because they, they set that stuff up in their system, you know, ahead of time. And so there's probably blister, pla blister packs floating around out there, you know, with other sculptors' names on it, it's kind of like a short run. It's sort of like an error card type of a thing. Gotcha. 
I was kind of wondering how that would work out. And if you go to Reaper, because I did it the other day, because there was a discussion about how much you had done, mm -hmm. you just put in uh, P key. Um, there's there's seven or eight pages. Yeah, yeah, it's about eight pages worth of stuff. Yeah. So so that's the other challenge is. Did I sculpt that? I've, <laughs> I've, I've got to go look, you know, and you've got to go through eight pages. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, over on my, uh, I've got like a blog um, that's kind of like my personal uh, sculpting slash hobby blog, you know, that uh, I haven't updated in like a year or more. Um, but I think that over on, on the links section of that or the, the About Me page, so, so if you go to patrickkeith.com, uh, you can go to that section, and I list like as many of the companies as I can I can recall on there that I've sculpted something for, and I've tried to link to the page that has my stuff on it because um, I was I was in a discussion on like a message form or a group or something about that, and they were like, well, where can we get like if we want to you know fill out our Patrick Keith collection, where can we go and do that? And so I was like, well, I mean that's going to be you know, pretty challenging. So I tried to to make a list, you know, and make it convenient for for folks to find my work, you know, if they're looking for it. So, hmm. Wow. So there's actually a way to search that. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. If you go to the Reaper, uh, actually, Dark Sword is set up like this too. If you go to their web store uh, and you just type in "search by sculptor," or there's like a little link or whatever that you can just search by, you can put the sculptor's name in it. And hit that, and it'll come up. It'll stack the the web store with just the models that are by that particular sculptor. Well, I did not know that. I am learning something new today. <laughs> it's a pretty handy feature if you're looking to, you know, collect. Like, hey, I knew this guy that sculpted this thing. And then you can go and search by that. Or, you know, they've got it set up by other means too. I mean, if you're looking for just an elf, you know, with a sword or whatever, an elf with a bow, you can type that in, and it'll come up, you know, with the matches on that too. So it's really handy. Yeah, that's usually how I end up searching everything through Reaper mm -hmm. anyway, is I'm like, Elf with bow. Yeah, yeah. Shirk, dude. <laughs> cool. So you sculpted for so many other companies out there, but you finally came around and you did Bombshell Miniatures, and you created this game called Counter Blast. That yeah. You sent uh, Nick and I some samples, and unfortunately Nick is the only thing that's done anything with it because he's not a dirty mover. <laughs> and uh, so... Why don't you tell us a little bit about how that all got started and what made you decide you wanted to do your own game? Okay. Well, I mean, um, I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, a, a war gamer from way back in, like, the rogue trader days of 40K. So, like, I was working in a game store as a manager, you know, whenever that pretty much first came out and hit the states here and started really, you know, gaining popularity. And it was like, wow, this is really cool. And Necromunda came out, and that was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, so... You know, every gamer, you know, kind of dreams of like, ooh, yeah, I want to do my own game kind of a thing, you know. So you you sort of formulate the seed and you put it in the back of your mind. And, and it was probably, I guess, around uh, 93, 94, you know, somewhere around there, that I started to kind of germinate the seed of like, wow, it would be really cool to do, you know, this kind of, a, a, you know, like a Necromunda-style skirmish game. And at the time... I mean, it was really kind of hard to find um, because really, you know, Mordheim and Necromunda and all those were, were pretty much the only skirmish games that I knew about. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sure there were probably others. Um, but um, so then, then I kind of, you know, put that away and, you know, put that on the back burner. And then, you know, once I started sculpting for, for other companies, and I, you know, I thought, well, this is a real possibility. It's like maybe this is something that I could develop and, you know, maybe pitch to, you know, a game company or something like that. So I started kind of working on some stuff on my own just as, you know, like a hobby. Um, but then uh, I guess it was around, yeah, it was 2012. Whenever, like, um, uh, the, um, uh, I guess CMON did their their Kickstarter for the, the Mike McVeigh game, the... Uh, Sedition uh, Wars. Yeah, the Sedition Wars, yeah, because I, I, I backed that, and I got a copy of it, and that did really well. You know, so then, you know, people kind of sat up and took notice, like, ooh, maybe this Kickstarter thing, there's something to that, you know. Uh, because I had watched it, like, the year before. Uh, a couple of my 
well, one of my sculptor friends and another uh, miniature producer uh, had also run a couple of Kickstarters, and they were and weren't necessarily successful, you know, on funding those. Uh, a couple of them did, you know, and it was like, oh, okay, well, this is for, like, little projects and things. But then, you know, the Sedition Wars thing really was like, oh, well, that, there's, you know, you can scale this up and really do something, you know, larger with it. And then shortly after that, you know, the Bones thing happened, and uh, I was, you know, sculpted for Reaper and everything already. So I thought, well, you know, maybe this is an opportunity for me to fund my own projects, uh, you, you know, without having to, you know, look for another publisher or look for, you know, somebody to, you know, to try to pitch this idea to. So, uh, so I formulated a plan. I thought, okay, well, then what I want to do is, like, I want to be a kick-ass sculptor, right, and, and build an audience, and then I want to launch my own miniatures lines. And then once I, you know, can, can um, sustain that at a certain point, then I want to launch, you know, my own game project. And so and it was probably a little bit early for us to launch Counter Blast when we did, uh, but it's... Uh, it's because it's that this version of it's kind of rough, and that's why we went ahead and over the last couple of years we've kind of polished it up, and you know we're going to kind of put out a deluxe version of it this time. Um, but um, uh, so I, you know, I found uh, uh, you know another friend of mine who was also a Warhammer player uh, that I talked to, which was Brett Amundsen, and he had done uh, some work on uh, the Secrets of the Third Reich for uh, West Wind publishing and, and that kind of thing. It had a little bit of uh, published stuff in there. And then I had already worked on the uh, Savage North a little bit for Reaper, their uh, their Warlord supplement. So uh, Vicky and I did the book layout and all that type of thing for it. So we kind of had some experience and everything, you know, already, you know, doing that type of stuff. So I thought, well, let's, let, let's go ahead and, and um, work on Counter Blast you know, and, and do some play testing and come up with some stuff, and then we'll we'll launch a Kickstarter in order to fund, you know, doing a rule book and an initial set of, you know, models and everything for it and see how it does. So uh, so we did that in, in 2014, and uh, uh, <laughs> we kind of had a false start on it because we were, we were talking about kind of renaming Bombshell Miniatures as, like, Airlock Games and doing it, like, as, a, as its own game thing. And nobody knew what that was because for the last couple of years they had been following Bombshell Miniatures. So that initial project didn't fund because nobody knew it was us. And it was kind of like uh, uh, brand, you know, like we were trying to rebrand it or whatever. So I thought, ah, it's, it's probably better if we just, you know, cancel this project and relaunch it as, you know, a Bombshell Miniatures project and then, you know, put it out like that. So, uh, so we wound up doing that. That makes sense because, uh, you know, just from what I've seen working on numerous Kickstarters in the past is that people really want that brand recognition. So if they're used to seeing Bombshell, the moment you come out with something else but you're not saying, oh, hey, by the way, this is Bombshell, you yeah. don't pay attention. And you yeah. lose a lot of your fans. Yeah, exactly. And they're, 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 it creates confusion and, and all that kind of thing. And if I'd have known that it would have, it would have been as confusing as it, as it was, we wouldn't have done it like that. We would have just launched it, you know, with Bombshell and that kind of thing. So, um uh, and and that's that, that. It's not just us too. I mean, because um, I, I talked with Austin a little bit with um, uh, Death Ray Designs, and they're kind of going through that sort of growing pains type of thing right now because, you know, everybody's used to them as being brushed for hire, and then coming in and kind of rebranding that. It's kind of like, well, what, what's this Death Ray Design? You know, kind of thing. So it's you know, it's making everybody aware that it's like, no, it's still us. We're just we're just calling it something else now. So that guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, Austin's a good friend of mine. I talk to him pretty regularly. I, yeah. I know about the growing pains that he's been going through with that too. Yeah. I mean, he's he's had his YouTube channel brush for hire. He started off as like a you know kind of side commission service, and then when he got into laser cutting, he's like, well, brush for hire doesn't really make sense for laser cutting. Mm -hmm. So let's change the name. And everybody's like, oh, we don't know who you are anymore. And he's like, well, I'm the same freaking guy. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. Yeah. It's I just understand gonna, the uh, the pain yeah. of it all. Yeah. Well, I I it was funny because I had I had run across their Kickstarter project and was kind of following it. I I intended to back it right before Adepticon, but since we were already booked to do the show, 
I was like, I can't really divert any funds to, to back a Kickstarter like right before we go and do this this show. So, uh, but I, I had intended to, you know, look him up at Adepticon, and, and it's like, well, hey, I want to talk to him about that because with what we do, with Counterblast being kind of a pulp sci-fi, you know, kind of a skirmish game, and with, uh, you know, its aesthetic being very diesel punk and all that, I was I was thinking, well that's a perfect match to talk to somebody about doing some, you know, scenery for you if their company is called Death Ray Designs. I mean, it's kind of baked right in. So, um, so that was, that was really kind of what drew me to that. And I had watched a couple of uh, interviews with him about the Kickstarter and stuff. And then he, I think he did a po- the podcast, you know, for you guys. And, uh, so I got to talk with him at the show and, you know, we're, we're working on doing some, uh, scenery pieces and so forth for the Counter Blast Kickstarter that's coming up. Nice. So so I said I conquered that shiny. It sounds like I didn't. <laughs> oh, there's there's lots more shiny on the way. <laughs> way to go, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I got I to gotta feed the cats somehow. Yeah, well, I totally understand. <laughs> so you, you mentioned Counter Blast. Let's talk a little bit about that. It's your game, your system. Tell us about it. Okay. Well, um, you know, uh, when Brett and I and Vicky were, you know, working on, well, hey, what, what kind of a game do we want to make? And so, you know, we, we really liked the skirmish level game, and, and um, it's like, well, it's, it's easier to kind of get into because it's, um, you know, a small, you know, miniature requirement. It's like you can play with, you know, three to six models or, or whatever it is. And I see that trend, you know, starting to really, you know, come out now in, in like these other these other games. So we looked at, you know, different dice systems, and we decided that, well, actually, Brett, this, well, kind of both of us, we, we talked about there's really kind of a better uh, curve to it if we go to a D10, you know, kind of a thing than, than D6. And uh, that was very appealing to me. And I also like the exploding dice mechanic, like, you know, they have in, like, the old West End Star Wars game. And um, so we looked at, like, all of these game systems. We looked at, at really like, went way back. We looked at Star Frontiers. You know, I looked at the uh, White Wolf, uh, you know, Werewolf game, you know, for, you know, a lot of the stuff as far as, like, skill checks and and this type of stuff. And, you know, we kind of pick and chose, you know, what we wanted to include in it. And, um, you know, it's not haphazard. I mean, we went through and, you know, uh, played through some stuff and... We, we wanted something that was kind of a, a generic engine that would run not only in, you know, a, a, like a skirmish skirmish level game, but also something that we could port over into a role-playing game and also like a space battle game. Um, because, you know, as old 40K players, it's like, well, that's the ideal situation is to, you know, to play fleet battles and then, you know, move down to, you know, uh, you know, drop ship type of the situation and then, you know, go on in and, and do, you know, incursions and that sort of thing. So, you know, we were looking at that as, as like, well, this is some of the things that we want to simulate. But at the same time, we also really wanted something that was kind of fast, you know, that, to play through that, you know, you didn't have to look up a lot of stuff that didn't have a lot of math to it or, you know, any of that type of thing. So that um, it'd be easy for new players to play it. Plus, since we were kind of, you know, going for, like, the pulp cereal kind of feel, uh, I wanted something that was kind of quick and dirty, you know, that would, like, simulate action. So models could, like, you know, jump across, you know, uh, gaps of the, you know, the roofs of buildings and, you know, uh, and fall off of stuff and, and climb up ladders and, you know, do all of these kind of adventure type of things. So, you know, we looked at other systems to see, well, how did they handle that type of stuff? And rather than reinvent the wheel, it's like, well, how can we, you know, create a mechanic that works in the game, but that's not too clunky and, you know, um, allows players to, uh, you know, simulate these, these scenarios. So it's, it's really, it's, it's not, it, I want to say it's campaign driven in a way, uh, because we've uh, skewed it towards uh, narrative style play in a way. Okay, cool. So you talked about the fact that you're... So you borrowed a lot from RPGs. You borrowed a lot from other skirmish games. Well, mm-hmm. I don't, when I say borrowed, keep in mind what I mean by that is that 
you looked at what worked in other things and you 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 took the gist of what those were and you you focused it into what you wanted it to do. Exactly. We 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 retooled it to work, you know, with our system. So it's like, I mean, there's a lot of ideas out there about like, well, how does line of sight work? I mean, you can look at like tons of war games and skirmish games already that's like, well, line of sight works like this. And it, it and it's very similar in a lot of games, and then it's very different in other games, you know, as far as like what counts as a model is behind cover, and, you know, what, what can I see and what can I not see? Can I shoot at something that I can't see? And all of these types of rules, it's like, well, uh, you know, some of these um, game systems have done really well as far as like defining that stuff and other game systems have not that they've been very vague leaving that up to the players so we wanted to kind of strike a balance in that as far as like well you know we we want to provide rules for the players in order to play the games that they want to play but yet still give them a little bit of leeway that it's like well you can kind of interpret the interpret you know this rule um, as fits your play style so uh, so it's it's not as detailed maybe as it could be, but then again, it, you know, we sort of we we want to provide players you know the benefit of the doubt that it's like well you know you guys have probably played you know war games and stuff before and if you haven't then um, you can kind of plod your way through this and just kind of make up the scenario as you go you know. Cool. So you, you definitely left it open to be a little bit more freeform. It's not so much cut and dry. Here is the rule for every single thing that will ever pop up. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. And and I find that's probably a little bit more fun for players um, than it's it's like, well, I, you know, I can't do all of this stuff. It's like, well, what we wanted to do was provide rules for like, well, here's things that you can do, you know, and then stuff that you and, – and it's general enough. I mean, we because it's basically – it's a skill challenge um, – or skill check system. So if you have a model that moves up to a door, you know, and it's like, well, I want to, you know, move through the doorway, you know, they can make a technology check if they, you know, want to bypass the security or, or whatever on it, you know, that is detailed in the um, in the missions. So, um, and that, that's something that's different. I can I can talk about how we've kind of come up with some different things than are in, you know, other game systems. And one of those is is kind of how we have our mission. Uh, uh, structure set up. So, for example, this was one thing that I didn't really enjoy in playing other miniatures games, where it was like, we all play the same scenario. The scenario says, okay, you deploy here, I deploy here, and then we're all going to try to reach the same objective. And, you know, whether it's kick the can or capture the flag or, you know, take and hold or, you know, any of that type of stuff. And so uh, what we talked about, you know, at the beginning was like, each player should kind of have their own mission. So you'll basically pick a mission that's different from your opponent, and your objectives on that are going to be detailed in what your mission is. And depending on whether your opponent has the same mission or they have a different mission, and they know what your mission is, they may or may not you know, try to thwart what you're trying to do, but yet they're going to try to achieve their own objectives. And we found that that lends itself more to narrative-style play than if you're just playing the same scenario. Um, because if both sides are here trying to take the same farmhouse, that's really not an interesting story to me. But if one side is like, well, I'm trying to rescue the guy that's inside there, and then the opponent is trying to kill that same guy or find something else, and they get in the way, then that makes for a much more interesting game to me. So we decided to kind of go that direction with you know, how... Uh, you select your missions. Cool. So, tell us a little bit about the system itself. Like, we we talked about like the different things that you've kind of done in order to make it its own unique thing. But mm -hmm. what kind of dice do you need? Um, how many miniatures? Like, how does a typical round look? Okay. You know, are there stats and skills on models? Is it just like a flat roll? Like different things like that. Yeah. Uh, well, pretty much everything is is a skill check. So even if you're gonna if you're gonna shoot somebody or if you're going to uh, fight in melee combat or any of that, it's all skill check based. And so each of the models has a little collection of stats uh, that's basically like a marksmanship skill and um, a melee skill. And then they've got another collection of skills that they would use for operational actions. And I'll, I'll talk about actions and stuff here in a second. 
But um, basically how it works is that uh, a model will have a stat, and for example, in their marksmanship stat, it'll be like a number of dice. And what you're going to have is uh, a difficulty score that you're trying to, to... It's a target score that you're trying to roll on the dice. So, for example, if a model has a 2 plus 1 score in their marksmanship and they're trying to shoot something, they will roll two 10-sided dice. And if they score the, the target score on one of their dice, they succeed in, in a hit. Okay, so where do you get that target score from? Well, that comes from the other model. The other model is going to have a defensive score that, you know, is inherent to that model, and it may be a 7 or 8, depending on what they're equipped with. And so that's going to be the target that you're going to have to, to score on your marksmanship dice in order to hit them. Uh, and then there's we've got other mechanics that, that kind of pile on top of that. But that's kind of the basic gist of it. So, uh, and then in, in the missions and in the, the rest of the rule book, there's other, you know, targets for different things. If something is listed that doesn't have a target score, then the default is always seven. So if I roll two ten-sided dice and I get a seven on one of them, then I've scored a success. Sometimes there may be more than one success needed in order to achieve an action. Uh, and then as far as it goes, actions, every model gets two actions per turn uh, on their activation. And one of those can be an attack. So uh, we've got that kind of broken down into two camps. We've got operational actions, and then we've got attack actions. So an operational action is going to be anything that's going to be like use a med kit or open a, you know, open a hatch or interact with terrain or interact with another model in some way or move. An operational action is, is movement, so you can move twice, you know, take a double move, and that would use up, you know, your two actions. Um, or you can make an attack, and an attack is going to be I can take a shot, or I can, you know, make a melee attack, or I can uh, throw a grenade, or I can make a psychic blast, or, you know, any, anything that's going to damage, you know, another model, that's, we're going to consider that as a, uh, an attack action. Cool. Okay, so... It, it sounds uh, it sounds very simple to follow. So it, it, you, you weren't going for like some giant need for math or anything along those lines. It's just basically, hey, you need a seven, roll seven. Yeah, yeah, and then and then you know like bigger critters or or guys that have you know armor or or robots or you know that type of stuff. Their their difficulty to hit you know maybe a little bit higher. Uh, plus we've got another layer on top of that where you can equip guys or they may come with. Uh, you know, stuff like uh, xenon mesh armor or um, last steel armor, you know, depending on what it is, and you can layer that on, on your guys, and it gives them uh, benefits as far as, like, you know, for want of a better turn, a type of saving throw, where, you know, if they do take a hit, you know, they get to dice to see if their um, uh, protective armor or whatever negates that hit in a way. Cool. So it, it acts as like in, in its own way like an additional skill. So you have this armor, it acts like an additional skill in order for you to say, I am even harder to hit. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And and cover works uh, kind of like that too because uh, it gives you extra dice to your uh, to your saving throw type of thing. Uh, so if I'm behind cover, uh, then I get not only do does my armor protect me, but I also get extra dice to roll. Uh, you know, to negate those hits uh, if I'm behind, you know, different levels of cover. We've got three different levels, so it's like, you know, barrels or crates are going to be level one, and level two things are going to be, you know, like, uh, uh, let's see, oh, yeah, like walls or, or structures or whatever. Jersey right? barriers, you know, that, things like that. What, what's that? Jersey barriers, like the big, thick concrete yeah, yeah. ones. That yeah, yeah, like the concrete about. things, maybe level two and all this. And you can nominate all of that stuff because we, we basically just give guidelines in the book. It's like, well, hey, this type of stuff is going to be level one, two, and three cover, and it's going to give you one, two, or three dice, you know, to your pool. But, um, but you know, you nominate that at the beginning of the game with your opponent and say, like, hey, you know, this area right here, maybe this is going to be difficult terrain or maybe this building is going to be level two because it's only made out of, you know, wood or, or whatever it is. And so you kind of go through that, you know, during setup. And, you know, that way everybody knows ahead of time. It's like, well, this is what this is supposed to be. 
Cool. Okay, so it makes it easy for people to determine what different pieces of terrain will be in-game as well, so it's not just random at the time. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay, cool. So you've, you've talked about the mechanics. Tell us a little bit about the world of Counter Blast. You kind of hinted at the fact that it's kind of diesel punk and has a mm-hmm. few other elements in there. Tell us a little bit about the world and how you fleshed it out. Well, we, we kind of started with um, it's it's kind of Buck Rogers meets, you know, Necromunda type of thing. And what I what we really wanted to do was something that was e- evocative of, you know, those Flash Gordon serials and, and all this. So I, I did a whole bunch of research, you know, going way back on that. And basically what we had kind of come up with was that in the past um, – it's around, you know, what, 1945 or so. The Trinity tests out in New Mexico for the atomic bomb sort of, you know, touched off a, a signal <laughs> for these little Illyrian scout guys that were looking for ultonium. And ultonium is a, is a, a mineral. It's, it's kind of like what powers everything. It's kind of that unobtainium type of uh, um, MacGuffin. So everybody needs a ultonium in order to power their ships, to power their weapons, to, you know, turn their TVs on and all that type of stuff. So these little alien guys were out looking for that stuff, and they see, oh, look, there's a signature. And so they go and land and meet Earthlings for the first time and all this. So it's this first contact type of uh, scenario. Well, of course, that's right, you know, during World War II and all this. So, you know, um, that kind of brings all of that to a halt because it's like, oh, look, there's aliens, you know. So... <laughs> Uh, so, so going with a, with a very pulp feel to it, you know, there's this sort of utopia that sort of comes out of that where the, the aliens are very happy to share their technology and, and, you know, they want to kind of bring Earth into their little collection of um, their federation, you know, as it were, the Galactic Council of Worlds. So now the game takes place about 10 years, you know, after that where... Uh, Humans from Earth have gone out to the outer reaches and have settled uh, these really hostile environments in order to, you know, try to stake a claim. So it's sort of this gold rush type of uh, situation where, um, you know, really industrial people from Earth are trying to go out there and mine this ultonium in order to get rich quick. And it's a very unforgiving environment. And uh, there's there's kind of... Um, there's the collection of, of the Galactic Council of Worlds, which it, it consists of the Shrenar people, which are kind of a cat-like race, and the uh, Illyrian people, which are kind of these little pear-shaped uh, <laughs> aliens with the eye stalks. And those are basically the space dwarves. I mean, I kind of came up with the idea for the Illyrians as, like, since there were no space dwarves anymore, I thought, okay, well, these guys are like that because they're, like, really industrious and engineers and they, they build these great spaceships and all that type of stuff. But they're kind of these quirky little alien-looking guys. Um, and then we also have um, the Alanti, which are kind of our aquatic uh, species in the outer reaches. And um, so they're kind of... There's three different flavors of fish people. There's, like, the big shark guys... And then there's like kind of a little little hammerhead shark type of fish guys, and then there's the other which are the the pisai, and these alanti are kind of like an angler fish type of uh, looking alien, and they're really heavy duty in uh, uh, psychic abilities, so they're very frail and and kind of sickly, but yet they can blast the shit out of you with you know psionic abilities and stuff. Oh, so bullets. Yes. <laughs> So, so all of this little uh, federation of aliens is trying to hold off uh, these invasions by, you know, some of our other factions that we have. Uh, we've got the Mechas faction, which uh, they're basically kind of your Terminators. You know, they're, they're, they killed off their own race, and now they're just a um, remnant of, of mechanical, you know, robots that are kind of seeking out Ultonium in order to, you know, sustain themselves. And they can't really make their own stuff. They sort of scavenge a lot of things and and, uh, rely on salvage in order to keep themselves going. So they're they're a pretty dangerous threat, I guess, like, you know, Cylons would be or, you know, whatever. Um, And then we've got another faction, which is the... um, 
the Niran, and they're kind of a Klingon Empire type of uh, species. Um, they're they're ruled by an empress, and it's a matriarchal society, but it's also a very um, serious warrior caste, you know, to their to their system, and the um, um, Let's see. Oh, <laughs> physically, they're they're about eight or nine feet tall, and they're kind of uh, this blue sort of coloration to them. So, um, so the, there's a little bit of the the Avatar vibe. We were kind of going for a little bit of John Carter of Mars, you know, with the Martian sort of look for them. So, um, so they have you know kind of that aesthetic. Uh, and then. Let's see, what is that? That's for who am I missing? You I believe know. it's the Edo Fleeny. I, I can't believe I, I've missed the Edo, yeah. Those are our, uh, our cephalopods. So uh, they've kind of got this really sort of hive mentality in a way. It's not, not really as much as like the mechas would be where they're you know, kind of sharing a, a, a Borg-type brain. But uh, all of... The, the other alien activity to them is, is completely foreign. They don't understand anything because they're, they're asexual in a way. I mean, they, they, they breed by um, uh, depositing eggs, you know, uh, into the, um, the spawning pool, and then the spawnlings come out, and then they grow up into other, you know, Edo, and uh, it's kind of overseen by the, um, by the, the overmind, which has several undermines under him, and it's this hierarchy of how they um, how they run their their society. Uh, but they are they are technologically advanced. I mean, they've got like tripod walkers and um, you know arc ray technology, which is kind of this lightning blast that can bounce from model to model as they make hits and that kind of stuff. So we tried to incorporate a lot of fun stuff you know, into that, since they're these big squid guys, you know. So they could do just about everything except snap. Yeah, pretty much. Gotcha. See, mm-hmm. that's how, that's the kind of competition I'd hold against them. Of course, that might also be why they're so angry and want to destroy all humans. Yeah, because they don't have opposable thumbs. So It makes perfect sense to me. The logic mm-hmm. is sound, sir. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So how, what is the length of an average game? Like, if we were to get into it, like, if you and I... And Nick was to sit there and watch because I wouldn't let him play. If you and I were to sit down and set up a game of Counter Blast, how long? So let's say we already had the table set. Okay, mm-hmm. how long would it take us from like choosing missions and setting up our armies to play and finish a game? I, I want to say it would probably take about an hour, hour and a half, maybe. You know, so you could probably get a couple of games in, you know, a night. Uh, and this is assuming, of course, that you know, it's like, well, you've you've played a few games and and uh, you know the rules, you know that that type of thing. Uh, m- most of the demo games that we've run have run longer than that because we're explaining rules and you know trying to figure stuff out or you know um, trying to help people that that are becoming familiar with it. But but typically the game when you just you know start it, uh, you can run them in a in about. I want to say if you've got like a couple of models, if you're doing you know like a smaller game, you could probably play in 30 minutes. Oh wow! Okay, so it does go by pretty quick. Yeah, it it can, you know, but it right. it scales up. So, um, you know, it 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 would just take a little bit longer, you know, the more stuff that you put into it. So. Okay. So, what is the average model count per side? Well, Vicky was really happy to to say you could play Counter Blast with one model per side, and that's that's pretty much true because it's it's skewed to the hero type of. Um, crew. Uh, so, for example, like in, you know, in in other skirmish games, you know, you're putting um, war bands together or crews or this kind of thing, and we use that crew vernacular in our game. Um, but basically, what we're trying to simulate is like Luke and Han and Leia running around in the Death Star, right? So, I mean, you really only need like three, or and not to forget Chewbacca. You know, so it's like, well, if you if you're gonna play with those four characters, you know, then you know you're gonna have four models in your crew. 
But each one of your models is going to either be a, you know, a specialist or they're going to have um, a, a cross-section of abilities that are going to allow you to achieve your objectives for your mission. So the, the more packed your, your hero is going to be, like with abilities and equipment and all that sort of thing, the more expensive he's going to be. So you're really only going to want to take you know, one or two characters you know, like that. Um, if you're going to play, you know, high points game, and they're going to have a lot of a lot of stuff to them, so you can also play games where it's a lot of cohort models, where it's like basically just troops, you know, and I can take a lot of low level, low points guys as kind of a horde type of a crew, and uh, but they're not going to be as as beefy or maybe as as armored, you know, as like your hero characters would be. Got you. Okay, so they're there's definitely a way of scaling the game to fit it to how you want to play. Exactly. And we really kind of wanted to lean that direction because we didn't really want to pigeonhole, you know, our players into like, well, you know, this is our game and this is the only way that you can play it. Because as gamers ourselves, you know, we have, you know, our own collections of miniatures and our own collections of um, uh, scenery and, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, maybe... Your game club likes to play, you know, you know, hardcore head-to-head competition type games, and you can do that with Counter Blast. Or if you prefer to play narrative campaigns and and have, you know, stories and so forth come out of, you know, what you're playing, we wanted to, um, you know, make that available to players too. So um, so that way, depending on what your play style is, you can still enjoy the game. Cool. Okay. So, it, yeah, I could definitely see how that would end up working out because, uh, you know, it, it also sets it up for a wide variety of scenarios, too, where it's like, I've got this one character that's a big specialist and, you know, Nick's going to throw just a bunch of Edo cephalopod rank and files at this one guy and I'm just going to see how much calamari I can make. Yeah, exactly. And and that makes for a really fun game. And we've, we've run a couple of demo games like that and there, it, it's really balanced that way, where there's just as much chance of having those two heroes achieve the objectives for their missions as it is for, you know, a big collection of Edo as a mob to go in and overrun them, you know. So, um, so that does work really well. Nice, nice. So, obviously you've got Counter Blast out. Um, the rules are actually up online. I was actually going through the uh, website at the moment. So it's got the beta version 1.3 rules? Yeah. Yeah, and what that is is um, when we ran the first Kickstarter project back in uh, 2014, we funded, you know, printing a, like a core rule book and then the initial um, faction starter sets. So there's like a little collection of models that you'll get for each one of the factions. Uh, and in the rule book, there's a lot of, you know, background and fluff and all that type of stuff. And then uh, each one of the factions has about, you know, 12 to 15 different kinds of models that you can pick for your crew. Uh, there's some heroes that are listed in there, and then there's a bunch of cohorts, which are basically kind of our version of um, uh, henchmen, you know, kind of a thing. So even if you want to take uh, kind of like in... Um, what is it, Total Recall or whatever, the Kate Beckinsale character, you know, she's like, you know, the the adversary, you know, to the hero, and she's got this collection of robots that's kind of chasing them through, you know, a, a section of the movie. Well, you can put a crew like that together where it's like, well, I've got one hero, but then they're kind of supported by a little collection of robots or whatever. So you can you can put a crew like that together too. Uh, and, and all of that's, you know, basically in that, um, that starter rule book. But as we continued to uh, to work on the game, we were looking at, at putting out supplements, uh, you, know, uh, you know, over the course of time where it's like, well, we're going to add rules and, and um, you know, create other missions and all this kind of stuff. And the further along that we went, it's like, well, why don't we just put out a deluxe color rule book type of thing um, since the first version that we did was kind of this little black and white digest type of deal that, that – it looks like, you know, a pulp digest from the 30s, which was kind of what we were going for, you know, on the design on that. Um, but, you know, we got some feedback, 
you know, from the, the players and everything, it's like, no, we want, like, a real rule book, and we want, you know, all this type of thing. So we're like, okay, well, we can do that, you know. So this version of it is going to have all of the additional things that we couldn't quite fit into the first book, and, uh, you know, like vehicle rules, we're going to have a section on that. And then the really exciting thing for me that we're going to have in this deluxe version is going to be the hero builder. And the hero yes. builder is going to allow you to go in and point by point create your own characters for Counterblast. So if you've got an idea in mind, it's like, well, I, I want my hero to have this and have this and have this, and they want them to be this way or these have these skills. You can do all that and buy it all points-wise, and then, um, you know, you can play that, that hero as part of your crew. Uh, or you can have a whole crew of, of different kinds of heroes by, by making them all, you know, custom like that. Nice. So it, it's definitely expanding upon the options that you already have. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's not really like a new edition of it. So we didn't really want to call it, you know, second edition because we didn't really change anything. All we're doing is really just expanding and, you know, adding more of the same stuff because the, the dice system and the mechanics and all that stuff pretty much work, uh, you know, as it is. We just wanted to be able to have more things to do, you know, with what we had made. Right. So what you, you touched on this a little bit in the beginning, but you were talking about launching possibly another Kickstarter coming up for Counterblast. Yeah, exactly. And um, we're, we were originally thinking that it was going to be towards the end of July, but if we did that, it would compete with Gen Con. So we're probably going to bump that to after Gen Con, you know, for folks. So uh, it's probably going to be about mid-August or so. But what it is, it's a Kickstarter uh, campaign in order to fund the full-sized, full-color rulebook, and we're going to come up with some new... Well, I don't want to say come up, come up with them, but I'm sculpting, actually, new character models for each one of the factions. So uh, we're going to have, you know, printed stat cards that will come with the models this time, and then uh, one of the, the features on the Kickstarter project is going to be um, sets of uh, cards you know, stat cards that you can get for each one of the factions rather than, you know, I mean, you can still download them. We'll make them available as a PDF where if you want to print those stat cards out on your own, you can. Uh, or you can, um, you know, download them off of the, um, the web store for free. But we're also going to make, you know, printed versions that pe people can buy as a set because uh, uh, I know that's really popular. People have been asking for that. So that will be part of the Kickstarter project too. So you're just making a little bit more of a sexier layout for people. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and right now I'm also working with uh, Austin in order to come up with some super uh, massively cool scenery for some of our factions that we're going to have. And uh, so I know he's been kind of working on some of that stuff behind the scenes. We're also looking at having laser cut uh, tokens and templates uh, available for that. Uh, I've also been talking with uh, Mats by Mars, uh, um, I, I got some stuff from Mario at Adepticon, and uh, I talked about sending him some art files to see if we could have some custom mats made, and I've, I've bought some of his uh, mats for demos and stuff already, and they're really cool. So we're hoping that, you know, we can offer those on the, the project too. Nice. So uh, you are definitely broke in August. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see what you're doing there. Trying to take all of our money, put it yeah. in Kickstarter. A little bit of it, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you know, I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but when people fund a Kickstarter, the first thing they do is they take a vacation to England, and nobody <laughs> sees the project for three years. Well, you know what's funny about that is, is that we've run six Kickstarter projects and funded all of them, and and uh, delivered all of them on time, except for the first one. Uh, because of, you know, production delays, we were competing with, you know, trying to get in to get our casting done at the same time that other people were trying to cast stuff. Um, but uh, we we haven't been able to do that yet. <laughs> it, that would be nice to take a, a trip to the Bahamas and or England or, you know, any of that. But uh, uh, the the fun for us it has actually been making the stuff, you know, because it's that's what I want to do. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, I spend my time, you know, sculpting and, and doing stuff for other people, but it's like, well, there's stuff that I want to work on, you know, and that I want to do, and Kickstarter allows me to kind of do that. So it's it's really kind of like Scotty saying, 
well, I, I would take vacation, but that's really just sitting and reading technical manuals, you know. That's, you know, so so our vacation is actually making the stuff, you know, for everybody. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I mean, I, you definitely love what you do. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. It's basically, you're making miniatures for a living. It can't really be that stressful. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you would think that, you know. It, it gets pretty tight around here sometimes, you know, with – it's like, you know, because we're really passionate about, you know, what we're working on and all that, it, it gets kind of heated, you know, in that, hey, I want to get this thing done, you know, so that, uh, you know, the backers can have it, so that we can have it, you know, and it can be finished and, and people can enjoy it and that kind of thing. So uh, – because it, it's a great thing. I mean, we just wrapped up uh, – I, I want to say wrapped up. We are still in the process of, of putting the stuff out for – the Babes 2 Kickstarter that we ran last fall. And we wound up uh, uh, fulfilling that early because we started shipping out packages um, like the first part of May on that. And we had a projected June, you know, ETA on delivery on that. So, you know, thanks to our uh, metal casting vendor, you know, Valiant, they, you know, stepped up and, and really, you know, cranked out the the castings and stuff for us to get those to us, you know, early. And um, uh, and Vicky's just been, you know, packaging and and you know, taping up boxes and you know, packing up uh, zip bags and all that type of stuff, you know, with everything to to ship it out. So it's been, you know, nose to the grindstone around here. But right now we're in the middle of casting the uh, the. Uh, resin velociraptor the jungle elf on raptor that we offered on that kickstarter project so i just finished up the production molds today and we're going to cast those over the next few days and then wrap up the fulfillment on that next week so nice nice so you're definitely plugging along yeah Which i guess you know you can, you're in that sweet spot right now because you're not huge to where it's like you're you're casting thousands of them at once yeah, you have, to, yeah. You have to deal with so many people, so that's definitely a good thing. Mm -hmm. Well, the the cool thing about that is, is I've I've got uh you know really exceptional vendors at my disposal. So like if we did go over, like if we did fund you know beyond what you know I'd be able to cast here in resin, I can go to um uh, you know our, our other vendors and say, well I need you to cast you know this many or whatever. It takes a little bit longer you know for the the turnaround on that. But at least I know, well, you know, if we do have a larger order, then I can, you know, lean on them to, to fulfill it. So That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Definitely makes sense. Well, Nick, uh, I know that we're getting close to time here, so is there anything else you want to throw in there since apparently I never let you talk? <laughs> so you were talking about the Raptor, and in this past weekend you were working on doing some of the stuff with it. And it was it was kind of neat when you were you were close to done with it or or pretty close. You you took all the photos that you had been posting and put them all together, and it was it was really kind of awesome to you know just see you know that part of the process. Oh yeah yeah I had uh, I had I'd been taking snaps on my phone along the way as I was kind of working on making the master molds and stuff. And so what I did was once I had had those posted out there, I, I put a little collection over on, on the hobby hangout. And, um, and basically how it worked was I, uh, once the sculpt is kind of cut up for molding, I'll make, you know, a mold of all the parts and then I'll cast off about, you know, six or eight masters of that. And I'll usually cast them in a blue resin so that I can tell, Hey, these are masters, you know, and then what I'll do is I'll take all those masters and I'll stage them up into like six molds and then, you know, cast a batch of molds at a time. So like right now in the pressure pot, I just finished up the last batch in there. And so there's like, you know, uh, six more molds of legs and, you know, six more molds of arms and, you know, uh, six molds of shields, you know, for the, the rider and all that kind of stuff. So it goes a little bit faster. The more masters that I have, the more molds I can make and, the more molds that I have, the more castings that I can do in a batch. And so I'm able to turn out, you know, um, a lot more uh, pieces in a shorter amount of time. Yeah, it, definitely, definitely awesome to see. Um, sorry you had to explain all the rules to Tim. I've been reading the rule book that you sent me uh, 
pretty religiously. And Monday I was like, hey, Tim, come on, let's play a game. Let's play a game. And he's like, no, I want to go to a Ren Festival. <laughs> My wife has never been to a Renaissance Festival. I'm not going to tell her no. Yeah, well, if she wants to go, I mean, you know, definitely you want to you want to be there to support that for sure. Of course, because my wife does not get into gaming at all. So when she said she wants to go, I'm like, wait, really? Really? We're gonna do this? <laughs> let's let's do it. Yeah, we'll make time for that. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I know you were looking at the uh, you've got the core rule book, which is the little black and white, um, the the little half size book or digest, I should say. Uh, but I, I did want to mention that you know because Tim mentioned this earlier. The uh, the Counterblast Deluxe beta rules that's got like the hero builder and the vehicle builder and all that type of stuff in it uh, and the updated uh, stat cards for all of the models and everything are available as a free PDF download off of uh, bombshellminis.com. So if you go to that website and you click on the little Counterblast tab, um, there's a link right at the top of the page that you should be able to download the current... Um, beta test uh, PDF, um, you know, for that version of the the rules. So there's there's a whole bunch of new stuff in that that's not in the little black and white digest book. Yeah, um, actually, I started out looking at that one, mm -hmm. and I'm definitely excited about make the hero. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the only problem is my hero is still on your website because I need to buy him. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that warfare wombat. He's oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and I think there's a there's a um, a babe called Greta that's kind of a big tree chick that might go with him as sort of a really useful companion. Hmm. Um. Oh yeah, that was one of the things I thought was cool was that you have a companion system in there as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Vicky's got some, some rules that she added, um, f uh, for like, I want to say they're like bond beasts. I know that the, like the Niren Huntress has a bond beast that she can has, have that's like a, a cat model, but I mean, it's, it's available to, you know, other factions other than just the Niren as well. Um, and we've been also talking about including rules for little sidekicks, you know, that's, that's like a little space monkey that's got a helmet on and, you know, like a space dog and that, and that type of stuff too. So <laughs> I want uh, the monkey with the helmet on. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're looking at at doing some characters like that. You know, for the upcoming Kickstarter project. So so when's the duck race coming out? The duck race, uh, that'll probably be part of the uh, the avian race that hasn't actually been discovered yet. So that may be a mm. future supplement. But yeah, we would have to do some birds at some point. Um, what else was there? Oh, and you've got a chocobo. A chocobo? Yeah, in your nearings. One of the, the, the rider in there, the, oh. the little creature she's riding. Yeah. I looked at that the other day, and I went, it's a chocobo. Yeah, it's not yeah. a chocobo. He doesn't want to get sued. Uh, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not, actually. And I didn't even know what that was until somebody, they were posting some stuff about that, I think, on our on our bombshell group. And I was like, what the hell is that? And so they posted some pictures of it, and it was like, I've never even seen one of those. Uh, the the Asro bird, it was actually designed after the uh, the big prehistoric bird in the Mysterious Island. So, like, if you go back and watch the old Mysterious Island from, like, the 60s, the one that Ray Harryhausen did, there's, like, an animated giant bird that attacks their little settlement or whatever, and that was basically what I wanted. And so, <laughs> but because the other thing is, like, more popular now, everybody kind of went, you know, that sort of direction with it. So, uh, and, uh, oh, but I did want to mention, it's like our, our Edo only have six tentacles. I, d I don't know if you've noticed that when you put the models together. Yeah. Okay, because they're not octopus. They're right, they're, they're actually a hex hextopus, okay? And the reason why that I, I designed the Edo to have six tentacles is because of um, the Ray Harryhausen movie, It Came From Beneath the Sea. So, like, when you watch that, the octopus that's in that, and it uh, it's attacking the San Francisco Bridge or whatever it is, 
uh, he was only able to make six tentacles for that because it was easier to animate. So he just kind of hid where the other two tentacles would be. But, <laughs> but that octopus only has six tentacles, and that's why we made the Edo that way. Nice. So the the other thing I liked with the um, with the Edo description, especially after I, I got the models in my hand and I was looking at them, is that you're like, some of them can have two eyes, some of them might have four eyes, some might have six. So, you yeah. know... They, it's just all on a... So I have to ask, is that just because you got done making them and realized some of them had four and some of them had two? Uh, no, no, that was actually... That was an intentional design, you know, from the beginning. Uh, and it's kind of an evolutionary type of thing uh, because when they start off as spawnlings, they'll start with with uh, two eyes, but then kind of the, the bigger that they get and the more they develop, um, they may grow additional eyes. And it... it Vicky was talking about it has something to do with their their psionic ability. So, like, the more eyes that they have may indicate that they may be, you know, higher level psychers than the other ones. So, and she's writing all the fluff and everything for that. So, I'd, I'd have to check with her on, on what her thoughts are on that. So, more eyes equals more psychic bullets. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know, because when I actually get moved and I can actually build them, I know what I'm doing then. There you go. <laughs> and buy googly eyes and stick them all over the models. <laughs> there you go. Googly <laughs> eyes. Yes. That's plus one to any roll, right? Yes, any roll that I choose at any time. <laughs> cool. Well, we do got to get everything wrapped up here. So, sure. Patrick, why don't you go ahead and... Uh, Take a couple minutes and whore out your website however you want to do so. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, if you want to know anything about, you know, uh, what we're coming out with as far as bombshell miniatures goes or, or counterblast or any of that type of stuff, it's usually going to be on bombshellminis.com. And I've got a collection of links and stuff at the top of that page that is going to go to the counterblast section. It's going to go to our web store. And it's also going to go to our Facebook group, which we really encourage people to come and join our Facebook group because I post sneak peeks of stuff that I'm working on over in that group. Uh, and uh, people share stuff that they're working on, you know, for the game. Or, if, like, if they paint stuff, they post pictures of, like, painted models and stuff that they've done over there. So it's, it's really kind of a fun little community that we're trying to build. Um, so I want to encourage everybody to come by and check that out. Um, but the big thing that we're just about to put into the web store now that we're wrapping up the Babes 2 Kickstarter project is all of the Babes from that, that project. So if you missed out on the Babes 2 Kickstarter and you want to, you know, get those models now, uh, they will be available in the web store this, probably this, this second week of uh, June. So as soon as we can send out the rest of the stuff to all the backers, we're going to be updating the web store with all of the current new releases and things uh, from that project. Sweet. And then uh, when, so you're planning sometime after Gen Con for the new Kickstarter to go live. Yes. You haven't come up with a solid date yet, but you, we, know, it's, you think in mid-August. Yeah, we don't, we don't actually, ha it's a little bit early to, to give a solid date for it yet, but I mean, I would, I would be looking at our website or looking at our Facebook page or group or whatever, and we'll be posting announcements as it gets closer to that because, I'll be dropping in uh, pictures of, like, the sculpts as work in progress, and I've already put, like, what the new updated stat cards are going to look like out on the group, so there's, there's going to be art and some other things, and I'm pretty excited about the fact that I've got two really great artists, you know, working on this edition of the book. Um, Giorgio um, Baroni that, that did, like, the art for the Conan role-playing game and Dust the Dust role-playing game and all that for Modiphius is doing our cover art, and he's also designing some characters and stuff for that. And I've also got Heath Foley, who's going to be doing some uh, interior illustrations and characters and things, too. So, Nice. Yep. So you've definitely got yourself a nice little team of people that you're working on this with. You're not taking it all on 100% by yourself. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've tried to surround myself with really awesome folks that do great stuff, and let them do what they do. So, excellent. Well, Patrick, it was it was great having you on. Uh, Nick, as usual, sit there and don't say anything. So uh, this will wrap up this episode of Observer Supremacy. 
Um, it was great having you on. We got to do this again once uh, once we get everything a little bit more normalized on this end, and once you get everything going for the new Kickstarter, because we we do like we do like doing some of the Kickstarter talks with you guys as well. So that way you could talk about the new stuff. You could let everybody know what's exciting about it and things of that nature as you get closer. Sometimes even halfway through. Yeah. So yeah, no, definitely we got to have you back on again, man. Well, terrific. Well, I really appreciate you guys inviting me to the show. And like I said, I've been listening to it, and it's uh, it's really fun talking with you guys. So anytime that you want to have me back, uh, I'd love to sit in and chat with you about pretty much anything. So Cool. Sounds like a plan. Thanks. Awesome. Well, that will end this episode of Skirmish Supremacy. And as usual, everybody, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. To see more of the antics that Nick and I do, you can check us out on Facebook at Skirmish Supremacy. We also have Twitter, which we can be reached at Skirmish Supreme, because apparently Skirmish Supremacy does not fit in Twitter. And if you want to email us directly, you can reach us at Tim at SkirmishSupremacy.com or Nick at SkirmishSupremacy.com. Thanks for listening.